All right, we're underway again, session 49, lesson 9, page 26 in your, in your outline. That'll be section 166 when we, uh, when we get there. Last week we looked at the Good Shepherd Discourse, a very famous and uh, touching discourse based again on the many, many verses in Tanakh, in the Hebrew Scriptures, that state, the Lord is my shepherd. For example, Psalm 23, verse 1. God is considered the shepherd of Israel. And he told of, Yeshua told of the uh, village sheepfold where many different uh, flocks would be placed in the sheepfold and the shepherd comes to the flock and calls them by name and leads them out. They know him by name. They know his voice and they follow him. And the proper way in and out of the sheepfold is through the door. But the thief, who comes to steal and kill, has to come in another way. And as you can see in this village sheepfold, in the, uh, the Nazareth village up in the Galilee, uh, the thief had to climb over the stone wall to steal a sheep and drop it uh, on the other side. But the good shepherd, the true shepherd, goes through the proper doorway. And we looked at this... Um, more uh, rustic sheepfold that a shepherd would make in the, uh, in the pastures when he was out spending the time out in the pastures with his flocks. And he would build some kind of a protective hedge around the sheep and then with one opening. And then at night he would literally lie down in the opening and he literally would become the door to the sheep. Which illustrates Yeshua's statement, I am the door. And so uh, he's the door for the sheep going in and out to find a, a pasture, their daily activities. He's also a door of protection, preventing uh, any kind of uh, scavengers from getting in and harming the sheep. And so uh, Yeshua is our door of protection and of empowerment. Then he talked about having another flock that he would uh, gather and the two flocks would then be one in his hand. And that was a hint of uh, the coming fact that uh, Ephesians, uh, like Ephesians 3, 1 through 6 speaks of, that Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Messiah Yeshua, that there would be Gentile sheep that would come into uh, his flock. He would gather them together. There'd be one sheep, or one sheep, one flock. And that picture was also picked up by Paul in the, um, in the uh, olive tree picture, where you have the natural branches, the Jewish people, uh, as part of the olive tree, and then the wild branches, the uh, Gentiles grafted into that place of blessing, into the olive tree. And so, uh, you, you guys know I never, I, I can't pass this up. So in the olive tree, you've got the natural olives, which are the Jewish believers, and you've got the wild olives, which are the Gentile believers. So we have uh, all these kinds of olives in the one tree. And then I... Uh, you know, Yeshua said, I don't, uh, nobody takes my life from me, from me, but I give it up for my flock on my own accord. So we talked a little bit about um, the anti-Semitic slur that is still very much in existence today, that the Jews are Christ killers. They, um, they're responsible for the death of Jesus even today. You're, uh, you're a Jewish doctor, you're a Jewish lawyer, you're a Jewish butcher. He's responsible for the death of Yeshua. And so I asked you to pick up a copy of my little pamphlet, Who Killed Yeshua? And there are still some copies over here. And if you need one, be sure and get one uh, at no cost. They do say $1.50 on them, but ignore that for the purposes of this class. Uh, because there are seven responsible parties for the death of Yeshua. And in this section of scripture, we saw two of those responsible parties. The first one was Yeshua himself. Nobody takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. And the second responsible party is God the Father. I received this commandment from my Father. So here two of the responsible parties are brought out in this section of scripture and there are five more. So be sure and pick that up because this is always an issue between you and your Jewish friend when it comes to sharing the Messiahship of Jesus with them. Then we finished up when we saw Yeshua at the Feast of Dedication in the temple. It's uh, winter, 29 AD, and he was teaching somewhere in Solomon's portico. Solomon's portico being the eastern edge of the um, Temple Mount there underneath the, the uh, covering. 
And uh, we saw that uh, when he claimed to be God very clearly, that the Pharisees were incensed over that claim and took up stones to stone him. And I suggested that the stones may have been found in the chamber of the defiled stones on the Temple Mount there, right to beside the uh, precincts of the temple itself. And I also suggested that a logical place to stone him would, be, it would have been the uh, Golden Gate, the Eastern Gate. Uh, he could have been pushed off that platform just outside the temple precincts and the large stones dropped on him. So that brings us now to uh, section 166. We pick up the story on, um, let's see, section 166. Am I correct there? No, I'm wrong. Section 161. There we go. Turn back to the correct page there. Section 161, page 26 at the top of the page in your outline, page uh, 151 in your harmony. And uh, part 9 is a new section of the harmony, harmony, the ministry of the Messiah in and around Perea. Now the basic element of the last section that we've looked at was this phrase, there was a division. We saw that there was a tremendous number of, a uh, tremendous amount of Jewish argumentation going on over Yeshua, you know, with screaming, shouting, and hand waving. Some saying this guy is demon possessed and he's insane. Others saying, can an insane man perform the miracles? Can a demon possessed man perform the miracles that this man is performing? Healing a man born blind, for example. So, tremendous division over Yeshua. In contrast, the basic element of this section will be the phrase, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We'll see that in a number of times. The exalted will be humbled, the humbled will be exalted. Now in the previous section, the major element was the fact that the masses begin to accept the Pharisaic explanation that Jesus is not the Messiah on the grounds of being demon possessed. And much of what happens in this segment comes in light of that fact that the masses are now accepting the Pharisaic explanation that Jesus is demonized. All right, let's pick it up then on section 161, from Jerusalem to Perea. Now John covers this, uh, starting in verse 40. Everybody there at verse 40? And he went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was first baptizing, and he was staying there. So now he leaves Judea. He's on, been on this preaching tour in Judea, correct? And he crosses the Jordan into an area known as Perea. Now here's our map of the area. And Perea is that big yellow slotch there to the, um, to the east of the Jordan River. It was a Jewish area east of the Jordan River. And the importance of the fact is, lies in the fact that Perea is outside the legal jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin. See my little arrow pointing to the yellow key there? He's now in the tetrarchy of Herod Antipas. He's now outside the jurisdiction of Jerusalem. He's quite a distance from Jerusalem and from those who would want to take his life because Jerusalem there is on the west side of the, of the Jordan River. And uh, here's a little close-up of the map. Now, in Perea, John the Baptist had a significant ministry at Bethany beyond the Jordan. Remember that many, many sessions ago? And so Yeshua leaves Jerusalem and he crosses over the Jordan River and he goes into that area uh, where John the Baptist had such an important ministry. And the people John had prepared uh, there to welcome him uh, do welcome him as the Messiah. And let's pick that up on verses 41 and 42. And many came to him and were saying, while John performed no sign, yet everything John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. So John's ministry uh, three years ago was not a failure. He fulfilled his mission, the mission to which he was called. He had prepared a people for the reception of the Messiahship of Jesus, and they accept him here. So in the bottom of page 26, you will have a little article about Perea and a map for you. All right, let's move on to section 162. Section 162 is at the top of page 27 in your outline. 
And now Luke picks up the story. Luke chapter 13, verse 22 is where we pick up the story. The question about salvation and entering into the kingdom. So again, he has left Judea. He's withdrawn from Judea. So you see his, um, his uh, plan there. He taught up in Galilee. Spent a lot of time up in Galilee teaching the Jewish people up there, proclaiming his Messiahship. Then he moved down to Judea, did a teaching tour down in Judea, again, proclaiming his Messiahship. This has taken about three years. And now, at the end of the ministry, he's going over into Perea. And he's going to teach the Jewish people in Perea uh, his doctrine and, the, and proclaim that he is the Messiah. So the sections we're looking at now cover the three or four month period from Hanukkah to Passover. We're going to go from winter in 29 AD to the spring of 30 AD. So we're going to enter into the final year in just a little bit here. From the winter of 29 AD to the spring of 30 AD. Actually, we are in the final year and the final months. Now, during this time that he's in Perea, he will make a journey to the uh, vicinity of Jerusalem and he'll resurrect Lazarus. But then he'll withdraw to Perea again and he'll return for his final Passover. So let's pick it up, section 162, verse 22, in the middle of page 151. Okay, everybody there then? And he was passing through from one city and village to another, teaching and proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. So uh, he's slowly making his way toward Jerusalem again. He's, he's on a teaching tour of Perea, but Jerusalem is his ultimate destination. So here's that close-up again. He starts out in the area of Bethany beyond the Jordan, and then he goes from city to town in the area of Perea, again, teaching the Jewish people li living in those cities and towns uh, his doctrine and proclaiming that he is the Messianic person. So he's visiting the, some of the cities that had been prepared by the mission of the 70. Remember the 70 had gone out two by two? and had prepared at least 35 places for him to stay in 35 different cities and towns. So this is the, uh, the cities and towns that had been prepared in Perea. All right, verses 23 through 27. And someone said to him, Lord, are there just a few who are going to be saved? And he said to them, Strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Once the head of the house gets up and shuts the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up to us, then he will answer and say to you, I do not know where you're from. Then you will begin to say, Well, we ate and drank in your presence, and, we taught, and you taught in our streets. And he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, you evildoers. All right, the question is raised, are just a few to be saved? And this is in stark contrast to the rabbis. Remember I showed you many, many sessions ago, the rabbis teach that all Israel has a share in the world to come? Okay, not to worry. Born Jewish? No problem. You've got a, you've got, you'll enter the world to come. You know, uh, hell is a Gentile problem. Not a Jewish problem. Well, he's teaching something uh, that's in quite a contrast to what the rabbis teach. Now, of course, this question rises out the, of the obvious rejection by the masses back in section 160. So his response to the question goes something like this. Entrance into the kingdom is being blocked by Phariseeism. And so it requires a breaking through, a struggle, a uh, forcing to get in. Strive, he says. Strive to enter by the narrow door. It will be hard work getting past tradition. And you know, um, rabbinic Judaism, Phariseeism, has programmed Jewish people to think along certain lines about the Messiah. And therefore, when a Jewish person is confronted with the issue of Jesus... Most of us go through quite a bit of a struggle, and uh, many Jewish people fail to make it. For example, uh, many of us who are in ministry today got saved in the late 60s, 
around 1967 in the Six Day War. That's when I got saved. Many of us were saved around that time. God just seemed to pour out his grace on the Jewish community in the late 60s. And so uh, I've been a believer now for 40 years and I've spent 30 some years of it in ministry. And uh, so we Jewish believers, Jewish Christians have been be proclaiming the Messiahship of Jesus for uh, 40 or 30 or 40 years now. And while there are more Jewish Christians in the world today than there have been for 2,000 years in uh, number, there are more Jewish Christians in the world today than uh, over the last 2,000 years, still we only number about 1% of the Jewish community. We are a distinct minority, distinct minority. So when the question is raised, are only a few going to get in, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. In fact, I consider myself fortunate to get into the kingdom because my mother made her break with the rabbis when she was in college. And so my Jewishness was the Jewishness of the Jewish Community Center. It wasn't the Jewishness of the synagogue. And uh, so when I came face to face with Yeshua, it was just me and sin and him. And I had very, very few Jewish smoke screens to work through. But for most Jewish people, we've got to blow away a lot of smoke screens in order to present uh, Yeshua effectively. So, the answer to the question is yes, only a few will make it. Yeah, Bonnie. Um, if the rabbis had taught that, that all of Israel was going to get in, then the Israelites Sure, sure, yeah, sure, yeah. he asks it out of his uh, environment, sure. All righty, verses 28 through 30, verses 28 through 30 toward the bottom of the page. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth there when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but yourselves being cast out. And they will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. So there will be many Jewish people outside of the kingdom, but on the other hand, there will be many Gentile Christians who are gen many Gentiles who will make it into the kingdom from east and west and north and south, because the Messiah's ministry was never limited to the Jewish people. It, it was always designed to go worldwide. And then we saw the theme at the end there, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Qu question? And the end times? Yes, yes, but that will happen at the very end of the tribulation period. You know, there'll be multitudes of Gentiles, one to the Lord during the tribulation period, and it's only in the last three days of the tribulation period that the national regeneration of Israel occurs. So it literally will be, uh, the first will be last. Okay, literally, that's what'll happen. All right, so let's move on to uh, page 28 at the top, and section 163. So turn the page in your harmony to page 152. And section 150, 163 anticipates his coming death with a lament over Jerusalem. So Luke continues the story in verse 31. Just at that time, some Pharisees came, to, came up saying to him, Go away and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. So uh, right at the end of a class... Uh, some Pharisees come warning Jesus about Herod's plan to have him killed. Of course, he's in the Tetrarchy of Herod Antipas now. So isn't it nice for Pharisees to be concerned about his welfare? Well, not really. Uh, there's a um, strategy behind the warning. They really want to get him out of Perea and back into Judea, where again he's under the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin. But Messiah gives a cryptic answer, and he gives it in terms they can't understand. Verses 32 and 33. And he said to them, go tell that fox. 
Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Now, in rabbinic thinking, uh, the fox has a number of associations. There's a foxy picture, huh? I think that's a good uh, portrayal of Herod Antipas. Well, what did this idea of a fox have in rabbinic thinking? From the rabbinic commentary in the New Testament, Rabbi Locks, in rabbinic sources, the epithet fox, or the figure of the fox in parables, connotes one who is inferior, as when comparing a fox to a lion. You know, the fox being quite a bit smaller and less powerful than a lion. Or it describes one who is sly and double dealing. You don't want Jesus calling you a fox, okay? So that's his estimate of Herod Antipas. He is sly and double dealing, very accurate picture of him. But he goes on to say it's not Herod Antipas who's gonna kill him, Jerusalem will. And there's a hint of his coming resurrection in the statement about reaching his goal on the third day. He's not talking about just walking to another city three days. He's talking about the finishing of his ministry at the resurrection when he rises from the dead on the third day. So a little bit of a cryptic hint there. Let's move on to verses 34 and 35. Here comes the lament. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you would not have it. Can you hear the pain in his voice there, the agony? Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you shall not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to cover this statement in detail at this point. The only thing I'm going to say about the statement at this point is that this statement is the basis for the second coming. The statement will, will, will be repeated in Matthew chapter 23. So we'll look at it in more detail in Matthew 23. But the point is that the key to the second coming lies in Jewish hands. He will not return until Israel asks him back. And we know from uh, eschatology that Israel's plea for his return will occur at the end of the tribulation period. So that's why it's uh, so important to be involved in Jewish evangelism today. And so I decided to take a little rabbit trail and talk about Jewish evangelism at the bottom of page 28 there in just a brief way. And uh, I'll put these evangelism principles up on the screen for those on YouTube. First of all, the pattern, the pattern of the Bible is laid out in the prophets. The evangelism pattern in Isaiah 49.6. Now, God is talking to the Messianic person here. This is a Messianic prophecy. And he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant, Messiah, to raise up who? The tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved one of Israel. So the Messiah's ministry to go to the Jew was not the, uh, not the whole extent of his ministry. It was too small a thing. God says, I will also make you what? A light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. See, there it is. From the very beginning, the ministry of the Messiah was to be worldwide. And um, has that occurred? Has that occurred? Come on, you guys. Yeah, of course it's occurred. Most of you in this room are Gentiles. Right. So the word has gone out to the ends of the earth, even to 21st century Orange County, California. You know, it's about as far away from Israel as you can get, right? This is the ends of the earth. All right. Now, Yeshua followed the pattern that was prophesied in Tanakh, Matthew 10, 5 and 6. Remember this? These 12, Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go to the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
So that was his primary focus and his primary ministry while he was on planet Earth, to go to his own uh, Jewish people. But at the end of his ministry, <coughs> in Matthew 28, we come to the Great Commission, don't we? And what happens to the ministry of the Messiah? It blossoms, it expands now. Matthew 28, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some were doubtful. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. There's the expansion. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And the age has still not reached its end here in the 21st century. The church age has not quite reached its end. So um, his ministry has expanded to that second stage. Now, even though we're to go to all the world today, there is a procedure to follow when instituting the Great Commission. And here's the procedure, Romans 1.16. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, those three phrases, power of God for salvation, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, are all controlled by the same verb in the Greek. And it's a present imperative. Now, being a present tense verb, what does it mean? <coughs> it means that it's describing ongoing habitual activity in the present time. Ongoing, constant, habitual activity in the present time. So, is the gospel the power of God for salvation at the present time? Is it? Right, of course right, yes. Is it to go to the Jew first in the present time? Yes, yes. same verb. Is it also to go to the Greek? Yes. Okay, so it's to go to the Jew first. That's the pattern of evangelism. And... Uh, that's followed up in the book of Acts. We see, the, uh, we see the apostles obeying that pattern. Here they're told, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria. See how it's expanding now, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Orange County, California. And it has happened. Now who's the example of following this Procedure. Well, the example is none other than the Apostle Paul. Now, the Apostle Paul was not sent to the Jewish people. That was not his, his uh, people group that he was supposed to reach. He writes in Romans 11, I am speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch then as I am an apostle of Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. He was sent not to the Jewish people, but the Gentile people. Okay, make sense? He follows that up in Galatians 2, 7 through 9. Seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. All right, that's his mission field. But how does he, how does he uh, put his, his ministry practically into effect? Well, we see this throughout the book of uh, Acts. He always goes to the Jew first in the book of Acts. For example, a couple, of, uh, couple of, of examples. Just read the book of Acts and notice. He always goes to the Jew first, even though the Jewish people are not his people group. Acts 17, 1 and 2. Now, when they had traveled through Amphipo Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where what? where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Shabbats reasoned with them from the scriptures. So going to the synagogue and going to the Jewish community was Paul's standard operating procedure. What is he doing? He's obeying Romans 1.16. Okay? And when the Jewish community re rejects the gospel, then he goes to his people group. Uh, Acts 13.46, Pisidian Antioch. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, it was necessary. The Greek word underlying that means it was indispensable. It had to happen. It was indispensable that the word of God be spoken to you. And he's in the synagogue, the Jewish people, first. But since you repudiate it 
and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. So now in Pisidian Antioch, he's delivered the gospel to the, um, the Jewish community. Now he turns to the Gentiles in Pisidian Antioch. That's his people group. And so, uh, you know, um, missionaries have often asked me, well, Bob, what am I supposed to do then? I'm sent to Japan, or I'm sent to India, or I'm sent to, I'm sent to, uh, to um, Ireland. We had some missionaries in our church yesterday, our Sunday night, presenting the fact that they're going to go to Ireland and plant churches. You know, the Irish once were in the forefront of missions. Can you believe that? And now Ireland is spiritually dead, and the churches have to be planted there. Okay, well, what should you do if you're called to Japan or to Antarctica or to, you know we're all over the world, right? Okay, what should you do? Well, I tell I tell the missionaries, well, just design a program to reach the Jewish people in your area, and put that program into effect, and then go to your people group, do exactly what Paul did, do exact go to Japan. And there's not a lot of Jewish people in Japan. Go to China. There are, we do have some communi uh, Jewish communities in China. Design a program to reach them, then go to your people group. That's exactly what Paul did. All right, now, uh, starting on page 29, you have a sermon preached by Robert Murray McShane. You may not be familiar with him. Here's a drawing of uh, Pastor McShane. He was a young man. He only lived 30 years, but he was... Uh, he was an evangelist. He's very important in Jewish missions. Uh, in 1839, McShane and a number of other pastors were sent to Palestine on a mission of inquiry to the condition of the Jews. This led subsequently to the establishment of the missions to the Jews by the Church of Scotland and by the Free Church of Scotland. So he's a very important guy when it comes to Jewish outreach. You can read his famous sermon you may not have heard of him or his sermon till tonight, but you, it's now famous to you. So that's on page 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. And notice at the end of page 33, at the bottom of the page, preached November 17th, 1839, after returning from the missions to the Jews, after going to Israel and uh, other places and seeing what the state of Jewish outreach was like. And he said it's pretty dismal. We're not reaching the Jewish people. So you can read that. Um, you can read about the importance of Jewish outreach there uh, tonight when you go home. Question. Was, if I looked up too late, the death date was 1865? No, uh, 1839, I believe it was. Just a short time. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. You'll see these in just a second. Uh, let's see. He died in, oh no, 1843, 1843, just a few years after he delivered this sermon in 1843. All righty. Okay, well, let's take our break. I've got 745, so uh, take your 15-minute break and then listen for the shofar, and we'll come back at section 164. All right, so go ahead. All right, let's pick it up on section 164. Uh, this is Lesson 9, page 34 at the top. The healing of a man with dropsy while eating with a, Pharisaic, a Pharisaic leader on Shabbat. So we start with uh, Luke 14. Luke is continuing the story in, ver in chapter 14. And we'll pick it up in verse 1. And it came about when he went into the house of one of the leaders of the Pharisees on the Sabbath to eat bread, that they, came, that they were what? that they were watching him closely. So here a Pharisee invites him to dinner, but again it's with ulterior motives. They are watching him closely, seeing if they can trip him up, seeing if they can find a fault in Yeshua. This has been going on for a, about a year, year and a half now. And um, he's invited by a, a Pharisee with some status. He's a ruling Pharisee. He could very well be a member of the Sanhedrin, just like Nicodemus was. And even though this guy is a high ruling Pharisee, there are four lessons that he needs to learn. And so we begin with the first lesson on true Sabbath rest in verses 2 through 6. And there in front of him was a certain man suffering from dropsy. And Jesus answered and spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, 
Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? There's a loaded question, right? <laughs> but they kept silent. And he took hold of him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which one of you shall have a son or an ox fall into a well and will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? Now, dropsy is called edema today. It, it means uh, excess fluid retention by, in the body. Dropsy or edema is not a life-threatening situation. Remember the Pharisaic position on healing on the Sabbath? The only healing you could do on the Sabbath is if, it's, uh, in if the person is in danger of losing his life, right? Otherwise, you just leave it alone. You can maintain their health. Uh, if it's not a life-threatening situation, but if, uh, if they were dying, then you could heal them. So this is not a life-threatening situation. So Yeshua goes ahead and heals the man on the Sabbath, which is a direct, uh, the, the direct challenge to the Pharisaic tradition. And the lesson that he's trying to drive home is that doing good works, such as healing men or rescuing uh, animals, does not violate Sabbath rest. I mean, come on, you guys. Your son falls into a ditch on Shabbat. Are you going to say to your son, well, I'm sorry, son. You'll just have to remain down there. I'll, I'll throw you a peanut butter sandwich. You know, is that what you're going to say? Of course not. You're going to go rescue him. It's, uh, you know, it's very obvious. Is The, it doesn't matter whether it's an affliction or an accident. If it's not life-threatening, you can't heal it. Okay? Remember bro the broken bones? You can't set the broken bone on the Sabbath. And that, that would come from an accident. Okay? All right, so that's the first lesson for this ruling Pharisee. <laughs> True Sabbath rest includes healing and good works. All right, the second lesson this man has to learn is uh, in the area of humility. And we look at verses 7 through 10 for that. And he began speaking a parable to the invited guests when he noticed how they had been picking out the places of honor at the table, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him. And he who invited you both shall come and say to you, give place to this man. Then in disgrace you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you're invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. All right, this comes out of the fact that there was a, a strong customs regarding how to be seated at a meal, at a table setting. And of course, uh, you get um, two Jews together, you get three opinions, right? So there's a couple of opinions on this, and I just want you to be aware of them. Uh, so, you, um, so if it comes up, you'll understand that. So opinion number one from the Babylonian Talmud. Said Rabbi Shishet, I have a teaching on Tanaite authority on this subject. So it's Tanaite authority. It's during the uh, time of the Tanaim. This makes it first century, right? This is in place during the first century, during Jesus' time. What is the order for reclining when several eat together? There's the question. When there are three couches, and I've edited this down, you guys, just for clarity. When there are three couches or more, the greatest in importance reclines at the head of the middle couch. The second in importance to him reclines above him on the left side, is what he's talking about. The third in importance below him, that would be on the right side. In this manner, they would go on and arrange the rest of the guests in order. That's Berachot 46b. So that's opinion number one. Two Jews, three opinions. Here's opinion number two. Just the variance. The most important person is always in the middle, says Rabbi Locks. He brings out the second opinion. So we have, we have agreement on that. Well, that's pretty good. The next most important was to his right. So now it's on the other side. And the third most important to his left. 
This was both true at table as well as in walking and standing. Now the, um, the data seems to favor opinion number one. So I'm going to follow opinion number one because this will become very important when we get to the Passover. So there is a dinner table. Now it's not a high table like you and I have here, you know, three feet off the ground. It's only a small eastern table about a foot off the ground, right down, right on the ground. And around the table on three sides in the shape of a U, cushions are placed. And the guests at the table recline with their left hand cupping the head, uh, the right hand free to partake of the meal, and the, their feet extending away from the table. Does that make sense now? Okay, so they're lying on these cushions down close to the floor. Now the most important person sits at the head of the table, reclines at the head of the table. That's the master, that's the rabbi, that's the papa, whoever it is. And notice that the head of the table is at the side of the table. It's not like our 21st century American thinking where the narrow end of the table becomes the head and so the, uh, the other narrow end becomes the foot of the table, right? The head of the table is at the side in first century Jewish thinking. Now, following the, what appears to be the majority opinion, the most honored guest would be above the master at his left. The second most honored guest below him at his right. Okay, does that make sense? All right, then in a descending order of importance and honor, the rest of the guests are seated around the table, one by one. You know, here we've got, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine cushions. So, uh, nine, eight, seven. So we've got six, five, four, three, two, and one. So we go in descending order of importance around the table until we come down here to the least important seat at the foot of the table. So the master is at the head of the table on one side and the least important seat is on the other side, the foot of the table. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Now we see in rabbinic writings and in the Bible parallels to what Jesus said. In Leviticus Rabbah 1.5, Rabbi Sh uh, Simon ben Azi said, stay two or th three seats below your place, that is, below where you feel you should sit, and sit there until they say to you, come up. That makes sense now? Okay. Do not begin by going up because they may say to you, go down. And then you're disgraced. Okay, I'm going to go down the, the war last seat. You know, it's better that they say to you, go up. You know, then you go up with honor. Well, I get a better seat, you know. Then they say to you, go down. So what's he talking about? Here's that uh, proud guest. He figures he needs to be uh, this end of the table. So he plops himself down there. And uh, the master says, my friend, you need to go down. So he's humiliated. He has to go down to the foot of the table. OK? With, uh, with his head held down between his knees, he goes down to the foot of the table. So he's humiliated. So what Jesus is saying and what the rabbis are saying, it's much better to start down here. Start down low, below where you think you ought to be seated, and then the head may say, my friend, come on up. And now with your head held high, you go up to a more important seat. Okay, see that, all that? Say again, let me back up here. What? That's just the, that's just the next most important seat. It's just <laughs> remember the the order of importance is clockwise around around the table. Yeah, that's not the most important seat. No, you know this is this seat here is just the next important one above this one, and then this one is the next important one above that one. Okay, you, you're thinking 21st century America here. Okay, that's you got to take that and toss that kind of thinking out the window. Okay, <laughs> question, Carolyn. Yeah, this is for the miscellaneous items of the meal. This is where the servants might serve the guests from. So there's never a cushion down there. No, so that's you can't the... can't get mixed up with above and below. No, 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 no. It's not a circle. It's a U shape. It's always a U shape. 
And this is for the miscellaneous items of the meal. Okay, question? In that setting, the least gets more access to the master. Yeah. Well, that's interesting, yeah. So the least that is opposite the master in this kind of a setting, yeah. It's still the least important table, but he might even be closer to the master, yeah. No, they're, the, the table's only this high off the ground. They're extending away. They, would, they might get sore hips. Uh, Bonnie? Well, in regard to uh, politics and kingship, yes, that's very clear. But in regard to table settings, this is the way it is. Okay? And this will become very important when we get to the Passover. Okay? You'll see exactly how it fits in the Passover. Yes? Oh, yeah, you're anticipating me a bit. Yes. 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 Peter was at the foot of the table. Yeah, good. You'll get A's. You get A's. You get your A. All right, one more question, Jan. In order to do this, there must be a lot of evaluating going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, you should discern where you think you should be and what is in the mind of other people. Yeah. Right. Age is important there in Thailand, yeah. So they want to know what you do. Mm -hmm. And so they ask these rather personal questions and you know, were surprising to me that they did that. And so my son told me that uh, uh, people of high regard, I don't know, banker or something or another, that, that, uh, that there is a bowing or, or, and they put their hand. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. Yeah. And so you have to know everybody's Right. Well, ex <laughs> well, that same kind of, yeah, that same kind of social status that you describe in Thailand, a similar kind of thing is going on here. Everybody needed to know socially where they fit in. And if they made a mistake, they could be humiliated. Yeah, exactly. Well, if you make a mistake in a pecking order. Yeah, it is a pecking order. Yeah, you could lose face. Exactly, yes. Uh, the last question. Okay, this was not for girls or women. This was for male types, right? Well, in a, the meal, a meal like this one, it would probably be all men, yes. But uh, I don't know how, you know, in the family, I don't think the family's worried about orders like this. But this is a, this is a meal by the Pharisee for other Pharisees. This would be all men. Yeah, yeah. And status is very important there, as you can see. Okay. So, the biblical, the biblical material that uh, Jesus is, is um, springboarding off of is Proverbs 25, 6 and 7. Do not claim honor in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men. For it is better that, he, that it be said to you, come up here, than for you to be placed lower in the presence of the prince, whom your eyes have seen. So there's that same principle. <coughs> Practice humility. It's much better to be honored than the reverse. All righty. Let's go on to verse 11 then. Verse 11, we come to our principle one more time. For everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. A lesson in humility. Thirdly, Verses 12 through 14, we come to a lesson regarding respect of persons. Uh, let's read verses 12 through 14. And he also went on to say to the one who had invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and repayment comes to you. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, since they do not have the means to repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So the Pharisees enjoyed handing out hospitality, but they were very choosy, inviting only those who would be able to invite them back, or people who were really clean. 
An example of this is the Mishnah, Demai chapter 2. Mishnah 2. If a man has taken upon himself to be trustworthy, in other words, to become a Pharisee, he may not be the guest of an Am Haaretz. An Am Haaretz means the people of the land, a common person, a non-Pharisee. So if you are going to be a Pharisee, you don't be the guest of a non-Pharisee. Mishnah 3. If a man has taken upon himself to become an associate, and again, a Pharisee, he may not be the guest of an Am Haaretz. Uh, don't go into the home of an unclean common person. Nor may he receive as guest an Am Haaretz who is wearing his own garment. So don't bring one of those common people into your home either. Notice footnote 15 in my copy of the Mishnah. Footnote 15 says, The garment of an Am Haaretz is considered a principal cause of defilement. So he may bring his unclean clothes into your home and mess your whole home up. Okay, so you don't invite him in. So that's the whole point. If you invite a poor person in, you're probably going to bring in an unclean garment. Who knows what that garment has touched? And now it's in your home, touching all these other things, making it unclean as well. That's the, that's the perspective. Yes? In this particular case, that didn't apply to Jesus. In this case, Jesus was considered worthwhile to invite probably because he was a controversial figure and uh, an important figure, a messianic claimant. But notice, he's been invited in order to be evaluated. They're watching him closely, the text says. So this is not out of hospitality or friendship. It's uh, out of evaluation. We're going to see where this guy is coming from. So that's the overriding issue here, to invite Jesus in. Okay. So Pharisaic hospitality was self-seeking and self-righteous. Only the proper people were allowed to receive Pharisaic hospitality. So the lesson is this. True biblical hospitality is to invite those who are perhaps unclean and could not return the favor. The poor, the outcasts, the handicapped. Don't uh, put all these uh, social stigmas upon them. Do good to them, and your reward will be in heaven. Your, re your reward will be in heaven. All right, that brings us to the fourth segment of uh, section 164 and the parable of the Great Supper in verses 15 through 23. We're now at uh, page 35 at the top of your outline, page 35. So verse 15. When one of those who were reclining at the table with him heard this, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A certain man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many. And at the dinner, dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who he'd, he had invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. And another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. And another said, I've married a wife and for that reason I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. And the head of the household became angry. He knows what these guys are doing. They're just trying to get out of the invitation, right? These are just... Uh, manipulative comments, leave me alone, I don't want to come. He became angry and he said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the slave said, Master, what you have commanded has been done and there still is room. Master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. All right, so he closes with this parable in response to the Pharisees' comment in verse 15. So there's a preparation uh, of supper, and certain people are invited. And when it's all ready, they offer these lame excuses as to why they can't come. And the master gets extremely angry. He realizes their hypocrisy. So he sends out servants, servants to bring others in, and they, they do it in two stages. A one stage for one group and a second stage for the second group and the supper is filled. 
So what's the point of the parable? The meaning of the parable is in the middle of page 35 in five points. First of all, the preparer of the supper is God. He's the master here. And the means of preparing the supper was the prophets. They prepared everybody with their prophetic message about the Messiah and the kingdom. Thirdly, the declaration that the supper was now ready came by means of John the Baptist and Yeshua. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. It's been prepared, it's ready. Come and partake of the kingdom. Those who were invited were the Jewish leaders of that generation. They reject the invitation when the supper is ready. They reject coming into the kingdom. Finally, now the feast, the kingdom, will be for, for those who have need of it. So the ones sent out into the streets and lanes of the city would refer to Jewish Christians who were brought in. And that's the first stage of the Messianic ministry, right? To Israel. Then when they're in, there's still room. And so the servants are sent out again, but this time beyond the borders of the city. They go to the highways, they go to the hedges of the country. And these are the Gentile believers that are brought in. Following the same pattern of evangelism that we looked at earlier. First to the Jew and also to the Gentile. And then we close in verse 24. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. So the lesson, the first shall be last because they rejected the invitation. And the last will be first. And so yes, those who eat in the kingdom will be blessed. But no one is guaranteed entrance into the kingdom. Only those who accept the invitation and choose to enter in. And guess what? The kingdom may even include those who are not expected. It may even include those who you wouldn't allow in. And it may exclude many who expected to go in. See, the point is you have to accept the invitation. You're not saved automatically just because you're Jewish. John 1.12 you know, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. You have to accept the invitation. That is the manward side of salvation. We have to make a deliberate decision of faith. All right, let's move on to section 165, the cost of discipleship. We're at the bottom of page 153. Section 165 is on page 36. The cost of discipleship. Now the emphasis here is on discipleship. He's going to concentrate on those things which prevent a man from becoming a disciple. And remember, salvation is by simple faith. By grace through faith plus nothing. Faith in Yeshua, in his person and his work. But discipleship includes much more. And so three lessons follow. First of all, a willingness to leave all in verses 25 and 26. This is under love and hate on your, uh, in your outline. Verses 25 and 26. Now great multitudes were going along with him, and he turned and said to them. Verse 26, top of page 154. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, is Jesus saying that we've got to commit suicide here? We've got to hate our own life? He's not saying that at all. Now, the word hatred in this context has nothing to do with the emotional element that we associate with that word. Now, in Jewish concepts, loving and hating has to do with choosing and not choosing. Malachi says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, in Malachi 1, 2, and 3. Well, it's not that God had this passionate, emotional hatred toward Esau, but rather in context, in the context, he had chosen Jacob 
and in that sense he had loved him. And he did not choose Esau. In that sense, he hated him. And when you go into Jewish writings, you see the love-hate motif all the time. Uh, for example, it can describe simple things like a Jew going into a shoe store. And he's got two pairs of shoes to choose from. And in the literature it says he loved this pair and he hated that pair. Well, he didn't well up with emotional antagonism against the pair of shoes. Okay. <laughs> Rather, he chose one pair of shoes and did not choose the other pair. So in that sense, he hated one and loved the other. So that's the meaning here. It's a matter of choosing. And you know, we use the same idiom today, don't we? You know, you look in your closet and you say, oh, I hate that blouse and I love this one. So you grab the one you love and you put it on, right? That doesn't mean you go into your closet and you rip that one blouse up. Oh, I hate this thing. <laughs> it's not what it's talking about. Because next week... Next week, you're going to go to that blouse and you're going to say, oh, I love that blouse. <laughs> and I hate this one. And you'll put it on, right? Okay. Same idiom. So don't make it any more than what it is. So the point here is if family ties in any shape or form hinder us from becoming a disciple, we must choose, to, we must choose discipleship. We must follow the Messiah. You know, an example might be a young man who wants to go to seminary. We have one in our church right now he wants to go to seminary in fact he's in seminary but his family was dead set against it you know he's single he has his own business he's living independently he's his own man but his family didn't like it but he said no I'm sorry I'm gonna go to seminary you know and he's paying his own way and running his own business he's got a big he's got a big load to carry but he wants to go on to discipleship okay do you see what I'm saying there that's the point so in that sense loving him and hating our family because we're not we're going to choose his way we're going to choose his way top of page 37 cross bearing one must bear your cross verse 27 whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple now this is a statement highlighting commitment the emphasis of this verse is again on discipleship meaning daily total commitment it's not, the emphasis is not on suffering. Many people think it is. Oh, my mother-in-law, I can't stand her. She's my cross I have to bear. <laughs> okay, not what we're talking about here. If you're not willing to make a full commitment to Yeshua, that's going to hinder you from becoming a disciple. It doesn't hinder you from becoming a believer, but it does hinder you from becoming a disciple. All right, verses 28 through 33, count the cost. Verses 28 through 33. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and he was not able to finish. Or what king? when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks terms of peace. So therefore, no one can be my disciple who does not give up all of his own possessions. Yeah, I hear the ice cream. All right. Now, Yeshua uses two illustrations. Yeshua is teaching here that discipleship includes planning and sacrifice. Planning. Think it through. Think through what you're going to do. Plan it out. If you're going to be a disciple, this is not some emotional decision you make at the spur of the moment. If you want to be a disciple, you think it through. You plan it out, and then you follow through. You work the plan, no matter what it takes. Now, a disciple is one who is a learner. So this is a commitment to become a lifelong learner, a lifelong follower of the Messiah. If you want to do that, think it out, think it through, plan it, and then work the plan, is what he's saying. Don't be flippant about this decision and notice the three points the three comments he makes 
uh, at each point, he says, you cannot be my disciple. Now, how much of our resources are we willing to commit to discipleship? Well, guys, I hate to tell you this, but Jesus demands it all. He doesn't demand 50% or 67.2% or 99.9%. He makes it simple. All of it. All of it. Okay? And he tells a little parable to drive that point home in verses 34 and 35. Therefore, salt is good. But if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears, let him hear. So salt is a good thing. And the believer, we're to be the salt of the earth and we're to have salt inside ourselves. But salt is an all or nothing commodity. It's either flavorful and useful or it's flavorless and useless. So a disciple can either be useful to God or useless. Jesus demands all from those of us who wish to grow from being a believer into being a disciple. So to become a disciple means you need to count the cost. Think it through, plan it out, follow the plan. All right, that bling, brings us to uh, the end of our class tonight. We're at section 166. We'll pick it up at that point next week. So let me go ahead and close in prayer and I'll send you guys off. Father, I want to th we want to thank you for your word tonight and the many lessons that are in your word. Lessons about not being a respecter of persons. Lessons about being humble and uh, letting others honor us rather than we honoring ourselves. And here, lessons about discipleship. Something that is... Um, a very serious decision, something that we should not just jump into. A decision that um, requires 100% commitment. And so, Lord, help us day by day to move toward that willingness to be a disciple, to follow you, and to be your learner, to learn from you throughout our lives, and to take those lessons and make them real in our lives every day so that we can be bright and shining lights to those around us, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We ask for your help in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week.